Welcome to Food for Thought, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. I am your host. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com and on social media and Food for Thought can be found wherever podcasts are found. Clearly, you found it. You didn't need me to tell you that, but thank you for subscribing to Food for Thought. Thanks for sharing it with others, for leaving ratings and reviews, and for supporting it. Food for Thought is a 100% listener-supported podcast, so please become a supporter today at patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Thank you so much in advance. While I work on some new episodes to wrap up the year, and what a year it's been, (laughs) and as I look forward to the new year, I thought I would share this episode from last year and just add a few thoughts. I was reading back over the transcript, and I had to decide how much I wanted to eliminate from last year's episode. I eliminated anything that was super dated, like announcing the conference that I was promoting this time last year. I was promoting the Joyful Vegan Conference that we did online virtually in February before even the pandemic hit. And so I thought, well, maybe I should just take that out. But look, life is change and it doesn't need editing. So I'm going to leave that in and say thank you again to all of you who supported me through the grief And I thought I would just make a couple announcements that are relevant now here in December 2020. First of all, we have the last online cooking class of 2020. It's Christmas cookies, whatever you want to call them, holiday cookies, cutout cookies, sugar cookies, and royal icing. And that's coming up very shortly. And then, of course, we've got all of our on-demand classes. So all of the live cooking classes get converted to on-demand classes as soon as the classes are over. So we just did the holiday food gifts class. And the reason I'm mentioning that now is because it's packed with recipes and ideas for giving gifts, uh, food gifts as gifts, food as gifts. So we did chocolate truffles and we did wonderful, delicious pecan balls or snowballs, snowball cookies, Mexican wedding cookies, Russian tea cakes, whatever you want to call them. And they're so beautiful and delicious and they're so pretty because they're just covered with powdered sugar. And then we did what can I say? We did salted caramel sauce. So if you're interested in those recipes and you want to watch that video, you can go to joyfulvegan.com, go to the classes page, and you can see all of the on-demand classes. We have also added not only gift certificates for the live classes, we've just added gift certificates for the on-demand classes, which I thank you. I forget who it was, but someone on social media said, I really want to get the on-demand classes for friends, and I would love to do that as a gift. And I thought, my gosh, I hadn't even thought of that. We only had the gift certificates available for the live cooking classes. But of course, now, because of that suggestion, you can get a gift certificate for the on-demand classes, which means that you're giving people a, a cooking class that's online, The classes are only an hour, so you're not sitting in front of the computer forever. The holiday classes are 90 minutes. We we did make those a little longer. And you're getting really fabulous recipes. And a lot of them are new. And a lot of them are recipes that I am doing for the first time for these classes. So that's at joyfulvegan.com. Another announcement I want to make, and this will be dated very quickly, so forgive me, but still, you'll be able to go find this. So no, maybe it won't be dated because you're going to be able to go find this long after the live event is over, is my TEDx talk. So one of my goals for 2020, and it was also my goal for 2019, it probably been my goal for a couple of years, a few years, was to do a TEDx talk. Uh, obviously, a TED a TED talk would have been lovely, but uh, TEDx is a, a, a community supported event, and the people who invited me to basically you know apply to speak at their event, the Dupree Park, Georgia. TEDx event are just lovely, and I'm so grateful to them. And sadly, the TEDx event was supposed to take place in person, but and in 2020, but because of COVID, it didn't happen. Now, they are going to be having their in-person event eventually in 2021, but they also offered the option to be part of the virtual event. And I think I just really wanted to get this information out there. And so I volunteered to be part of the virtual event, which is coming up this weekend, December 5th and 6th. Is that right? December 5th and 6th, this uh, Saturday 
and Sunday. And so if you're interested in getting tickets for that event, I would be most grateful. It supports this wonderful event. There's lots of animal folks, lots of people who are going to be part of the virtual event, but also animal people who are part of the in-person event. I just don't know when that's going to take place. And I didn't want to keep waiting and just keep waiting and just not know when I was going to be able to do that. So you can register for the TEDx Dupree Park event. Uh, online if you go to TEDx Dupree Park and I will make sure that link is at joyfulvegan.com in today's episode the the post for today's episode and it's very affordable it supports this event it supports this work it supports the the, the TEDx talk that I wrote and spent I can't even tell you how many hours I spent on this talk. And so the talk itself is called Animology, and I think you know what it's about. It's about the animal-related words and phrases we use every day and how they affect and reflect our relationship with and our treatment of other animals for better and for worse. And so it is, to me, such a gift to be able to do this talk through TEDx. And I I'm very proud of it. I spent hours and hours and hours writing it and crafting it and tweaking it and memorizing it. And so you can watch the video as part of the TEDx talk if you register for that event. So I would be most grateful. So that's the other thing I wanted to mention. And then finally, yeah, thank you so much for purchasing The Joyful Vegan. I I don't know why the book just didn't have the traction that I thought it would have. I don't I don't quite know why. Uh, it is a book about uh, the willful blindness that we have around eating animals and the common threads that we all share once we become awake and once we remove those blinders and and become vegan and how to then keep those blinders off and stay joyful and stay vegan and understand why others don't. And so if you're vegan and you thought, well, I don't need that book because I'm never going to stop being vegan, it's not just about your experience. It's about understanding other people's experiences and how we can advocate even more effectively understanding how other people are processing this. So for those who read it and reviewed it, I'm very grateful. If you have read it and you haven't reviewed it, I would be most grateful if you go to Amazon and Goodreads and review the book, even if you don't shop at Amazon, even if you don't use Goodreads, others do. Millions and millions of people do. So your review makes a difference. And of course, if you haven't purchased it for yourself, I'm very proud of it. And I think you'll get a lot out of it. At least that's what I've been told by those who read it. And it's a wonderful gift as well. You can gift it to organizations, to vegan organizations, to animal organizations. And perhaps it's just going to be one of those books that has just a long, steady, slow, uh, you know, life in this world, uh, as opposed to just this massive surge. Uh, But I would be I would be just really appreciative if you checked out the book, Joyful Vegan, How to Stay Vegan in a World That Wants You to Eat meat, dairy, and eggs. People have been asking me also about our trips, and I think we all have reason to be hopeful for 2021. There are lots of signs are pointing toward the vaccines that could come out and really just really turn this virus around by the summer. And so with what we know about the virus and how to manage it and how to prevent it and avoid getting it and the the vaccine that's coming out, etc., Uh, We all feel pretty confident that we're at least willing to try and see if we can do our trips in 2021. Obviously, all of our trips were canceled in 2020, and I should really say postponed because we were just moving them to 2021. Our Botswana trip is, there might be a couple spots, but we did have people on the waiting list. I think a couple people uh, are not coming to Botswana once we moved it, but everybody else is. So that's still pretty well full. And because we had the waiting list, I, I don't know that there's any slots left, but you could go to CP trips.com and you can see that trip if it's still if there are spaces you can certainly uh, let us know that you're interested but we also have france in september and tuscany in october so dordogne france and we're going to go to an, the elephant sanctuary we're supposed to go to and go to lasco caves and and just float on the river and cycle in the countryside and just have a quintessential france uh, trip 
Does that sound, make sense? A quintessential French trip experience. Anyway, you, get, you know what I mean. And then Tuscany is a new trip that we're doing, and that's going to be in October. So if you are interested in either of those trips or any of those trips or both of those trips or all of those trips or Botswana as well, go to cpgtrips.com, check it out. And then we have all of the precautions that we're taking because of COVID on the website there as well. Uh, one more gift, and I think I probably already mentioned this in the episode, is the 30-Day Vegan Challenge. Don't forget, you can gift that to a friend. So if there's anybody you think would benefit or like to experience uh, taking the 30-Day Vegan Challenge, you can go to 30dayveganchallenge.com. Okay, so enjoy this episode. I still plan on sharing a new one. I was going to start talking about other things I'm doing to make this holiday meaningful this year, and I thought, no, I'll just do another episode. Why don't you just soak in what I talked about last year? Lots of zero-waste ideas, and interestingly, there are some ideas that are, I should say most of the ideas are relevant still during COVID and during the times that we are distancing and not traveling, and there's obviously trips as one of the suggestions and concerts as another, but honestly, there's lots of suggestions in this episode that have nothing to do with uh, just getting together and being close to one another, but it does have to do with, many suggestions have to do with being generous, being compassionate, creating community, and doing what we can to have the least negative impact on our beautiful world. So enjoy this episode, Lessons and Gifts, Making Meaningful Holidays. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I hope you are doing fabulously well. As we come to the end of another year, I want to thank you sincerely, genuinely for all you have done to demonstrate to me that the work I spend all my time creating is valuable to you. Thank you for listening to this podcast and for listening to Animology Podcast, for buying my books, for being a supporter, for registering for my conference, for joining me on our vegan trips around the world, for following me on social media. I'm so grateful to do this work. And the only reason I'm able to do it is because you want to read and listen to and watch what I create. I don't do this work in a vacuum. So thank you for being my audience. I am recording this while I'm in the room with my foster cats and I can hear Bo snoring. I don't know if you've heard him. I'm going to give him a little nudge because otherwise I'm going to be distracted by his cute little snore. Okay. (laughs) At this time of year, I don't know about you, but I find myself feeling very reflective, very excited, exhilarated, anxious, and grateful. I'm excited and exhilarated because I love looking ahead and creating intentions and plans and goals for the next year. I feel reflective because I do reflect on the past year. And I ask, did I make the most of it? Did I live my life to the fullest? Did I waste this precious time we all have? Was I kind and patient and compassionate, as compassionate and as patient and as kind as I could be with people in my life? So those are the questions I ask myself. And of course, I'm anxious because I want to make sure I did those things well. And if not, then of course, I need to plan to do them better in the future. I'm also anxious because with another year gone, I continue to be acutely aware of my and of our mortality. That might sound macabre, but it is the reality. And it's something that we all face and something I'm aware of with each passing year. My parents are both still alive, but they're not doing great. My mother's in hospice now, and it's rather heartbreaking to watch someone decline. I'm healthy overall. I have dealt with some health issues this past year or two, including one that I'm still battling that I don't know the prognosis of. And of course, we all just experience the usual anxieties uh, as we contemplate the future for ourselves, for the animals, for our wild spaces, and for our earth. But that is life. And I'm all in. And we're all in this together. And I'm grateful for that. Other than that, I love this time of year. (laughs) Uh, I talked in a previous episode many years ago about how I know a lot of people don't like making New Year's resolutions because they wind up feeling worse when they don't come to fruition. And I get it. I understand not wanting to set yourself up for failure. But I think there's something very powerful about declaring what you want, saying it out loud, writing it down. I believe we create what we think 
And so if we hold back saying what we really want, then it's harder to manifest. It's harder to deliver our vision and our hopes and our wishes and our goals. That's the way I live my life. It might sound wishy-washy to some of you, but that's how I've always lived my life, creating intentions and goals and finding that that practice alone is one of the reasons I follow through because I've declared them, whatever they may be, whatever goals I might have, whatever intentions I might have, I declare them. And I think it's a powerful principle that can be seen in everything from the secular to the holy, that idea of the power of the word. So though I don't necessarily create New Year's resolutions, as it were, I do create intentions for the year, for the next year to come. And I really love the transition period from the end of one year to the next. I've always loved transitions. I've always loved thresholds. It's one of the reasons I love gates. It's one of the reasons I love arbors and trellises because I love the transition from one space to the next. And so that's why I love this time of year. I create these intentions and goals personally. I do the same for my professional life and I do the same for my romantic life. My husband and I sit down. Well, I I, I usually am the one inspiring us sitting down, but he's all in. Um, and we sit down this time together every year and we create our intentions and goals as a couple. It's almost like we renew our vows on an annual basis, which is pretty, pretty lovely. So I think this is a magical time and it doesn't necessarily have to be on January 1st that we do this or, you know, approaching January 1st, approaching a new year. I personally ruminate at the change of each season. I see them as the thresholds uh, that we cross and we can be reflective about and forward thinking about. And I do the same each day. I think transitions from one day to the next, from one week to the next, from one season to the next, from one space to the next, from one year to the next are sacred times and sacred experiences so that we can look backward and forward. So I called this episode Lessons and Gifts for many reasons. One, because that has been one of my life's mottos for as long as I can remember, that life is made up of lessons and gifts. That's it. Every experience is an opportunity to learn from or a gift to be thankful for or both, but that's it. Lessons and gifts, that's all we get. Number two, I called it lessons and gifts because that's what this time of year can be, a time to reflect on lessons and gifts from the previous year and thinking about how we want to apply them and do them differently or continue them uh, in the next year. And three, I called it lessons and gifts because this is the time of year when we do bestow gifts upon one another and we receive gifts in return. So what I'd like to do in this episode is to talk about holiday gifts, both metaphorically and literally. Metaphorically in terms of making this transition to the new year meaningful, and literally in terms of meaningful gifts we give. So let's do the latter first. Now, you know I'm someone who strives to live minimally and reduce waste. You've been following me and listening to my episodes about zero waste, and I have a lot more to say about that. But that's not to say that I never purchase anything at all. Remember, the definition of waste that guides me is thus. (laughs) Waste is any material or good whose owner has stopped taking responsibility for it. Any material good whose owner has stopped taking responsibility for. And the definition of zero waste that guides me is... For me, living zero waste and making zero waste choices, of course, zero is just an aspiration. We're never going to be able to live zero waste unless we're not here. So zero waste is aspirational, but it is uh, the goal for me, the aspiration is to live my life in such a way that I value the things I bring into my life or the things that I already have in my life. And I eliminate the things that don't bring value. And that if I want to bring something into my life, the question I ask myself is, will I value it? And can I take full responsibility for it? And I talk about that a bit more in the episode I did on food waste. I did three episodes, uh, three-parter on food waste. And I talk about that, that, you know, you have a banana peel, you eat a banana, you have a banana peel left over. That banana peel isn't waste until I stop taking responsibility for it and I throw it in the bin or I throw it on the street. But if I take responsibility for it, then I actually enable it to uh, to manifest its fullest value, right? So what? So what? How can I make value out of that? 
peel, that banana peel, by composting it. And when I compost it, then that banana peel becomes part of nutrients that go back into the soil and help other plants regenerate, right? So that's an example of, can I take responsibility for something? For instance, if I, if you know, even receipts these days when I go into the store and I get a re- paper receipt, if I just, they, you know, they usually say, do you want the receipt? If you say no, they're just going to crumble it up and throw it in the bin. And I have no idea what happens to that piece of paper at that point. But if I say yes, I will take that receipt. Then at home, I can take responsibility for it. I can compost it. I can shred it and compost it. I can, uh, I can recycle it, right? So that's an example of taking responsibility for everything that we can. And so when it comes to buying gifts for others, I use the same criteria. And I think there are a lot of ways we can gift friends and family with things, but things that will last a long time. One of the things I talked about in a previous episode about zero waste is, you know, the idea is for the item to last for a lifetime. And that would be a human lifetime, but to round it up, we'll just say 100 years. So the idea is to have something that's going to last, that's made of good quality. We have a throwaway culture these days and everything is about what, you know, what can I get that's the cheapest? And then, of course, that means it's made without quality uh, and it is something that gets thrown away very quickly. So I just bought a new uh, 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 suitcase, a carry-on suitcase. And I will actually, the one that I have, I'm going to give that to Goodwill. But the one that I just bought, there's a lifetime warranty on that. And that is what you want to look for when you're buying things because it means that the manufacturer can stand behind the quality of the good that they're selling. And if they can't, then it's very likely that that item is going to break down very quickly and it will wind up in a landfill very quickly <laughs> and and stay in that landfill forever. So that's what it means to take responsibility, to value the things we bring into our lives, to uh, value the things that we give to others as well. So looking for things that actually are quality and that will last for for 100 years or more. And one way to do that when we're buying things is to get quality things that might cost a little bit more when we're first buying them. But especially if there's a lifetime warranty, then we're kind of guaranteed that that's going to last a long time. And if it doesn't, then we'd be able to reach out to the manufacturer and, and, and you know figure out how to get it fixed or replace it if, if need be. So that's kind of my general guiding principles. Those are my guiding principles. When uh, I'm going to name some specific things. And of course, when I'm talking about what we do buy, I, I do encourage, I try to buy locally as much as possible, not only to support local businesses, but also to reduce shipping and packing materials. But just in case that's not always an option, because I realize that it's not all the time, I have included links to the products, to the websites that sell these products that I mentioned on this episode on my website at ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com. Now you can follow the links directly and I do get a small commission, but the bottom line is that list is there for you whenever you want to refer to it. That way you don't have to sit here and sit with a pen and paper uh, and and write down everything I'm saying. Just sit back and listen and then go over to ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com and search for 25 meaningful zero waste ethical gifts. If you just searched for 25 gifts on my website, you'll find it. (laughs) So that's what this list is going to be, is 25 meaningful zero waste ethical gifts. And of course, that means for me always, especially nothing with animal products, you know, obviously that's kind of first and foremost, and that's just a given. Also, if you do follow the links to make your purchases from websites, there are things you can do to make ordering online a little less resource intensive. Number one is you can buy products that are packaged in paper. And I make a point to include those that I'm aware of that package their things in paper, not plastic. Did the best I could. You might find that I was wrong and that's fine. Don't get it. (laughs) But that's one way you can reduce packaging. Uh, And number two is let the company you're ordering from, including Amazon, know that you don't want plastic or peanuts as the packing material. You can call them once you place the order. You can call them to place the order. You can do an online chat while you're placing the order or while or after you place the order and you tell them, please do not include plastic packaging in my uh, in my uh, in my order, and they will then package it. And this is this has worked for me. They package it in paper, and you get a cardboard box. Obviously, that can be composted or that can be recycled. Now, look, I know that sounds like oh, that's a pain. I don't want to have to call. Really, taking responsibility for the things that we're doing 
means it might be a little inconvenient, but in the end, we can say that we took responsibility. So I categorized these 25 gifts while meeting the criteria that I spoke about earlier, my principles of zero waste. So I categorized them. The first category is food and drink. So number one, loose tea is such a great gift. I know you all know I'm a tea junkie and I stand by my tea junkiness, but I really just think tea is the most wonderful thing in the world. And in an upcoming episode that I've already written that I have yet to record that won't be live uh, until after this episode goes live, is I talk about how zero waste has changed the way I eat. And so in that episode, you're going to hear me talk about how many tea bags, many tea bags, uh, brands, are made with plastic. Now, aside from the fact that most people don't even compost their tea bags anyway, even the ones not made with plastic, one way to reduce waste is to get someone loose tea as a gift and, of course, as a gift for yourself. Now, I've told you about my favorite tea in the past. I get my tea from Far Leaves. It's a tea company here in o- in Berkeley. I was going to say Oakland, but it's Berkeley. And I go in and I actually bring my jars and they fill up the jars for me. There might be tea places near you that do the same thing. There might be bulk sections of tea in a grocery store near you. So you may be surprised that there may be somewhere near you where you can buy tea in bulk and you don't have to get packaging. So that's one, one option. But if you do order from Far Leaves, Dot com. First of all, you'll get 10% off your order, and they're not sponsoring this podcast or anything. They just have this perpetual code on their website because they know I talk about them all the time. I don't even get anything back from it. It's just that I really think they're a great company, and uh, and I support them. And so they have a 10% off discount code, which is Colleen, C-O-L-L-E-E-N, all lowercase, you'll get 10% off your order if you put that coupon code in. And their tea comes in tins. And you can reuse these tins. They're cute little round tins. And you can reuse them again and again. They wrapped in paper. And you can even take the paper off and, you know, use these tins for gifts in the future, whatever you want to use them for, store your tea. And if you don't, you know, or once you're done reusing them again and again, they're tins. So they are recyclable. Okay, so at least there's that. So farleaves.com. But just loose tea is what I recommend. And then to make the full experience valuable for your recipient, think about getting them a tea ball or some kind of tea strainer, either of which would be made from stainless steel. I mean, I don't think you'd find a tea strainer made of plastic. So that's not going to be an issue. But get a nice stainless steel tea strainer or tea ball. Uh, I've had tea balls for, I don't know, at this point, 25 years. I mean, like you'll have them for a long time. So just get a nice little tea ball wrap their gift in a pretty tea towel. Mm -hmm. You see a theme here? And there's a beautiful gift. And, you know, again, as zero waste as possible. And just as an aside, if you haven't listened yet to the podcast episode on food waste, I really encourage you to do so. Everyone can compost. So I mentioned that not everybody composts their tea bags. And frankly, a lot of them wouldn't be compostable because they're made of plastic, but people don't compost their tea leaves either. And I do talk about the fact that no food, including tea leaves, no food, no food, no edible food should ever go into the garbage. It should never go into the landfill. It should always be composted Uh, used up as much as possible, and then composted. And everybody can compost. So I talk about that in a podcast episode on zero waste related to food, food waste. And I really encourage you to listen to it. Changed, kind of was a game changer for me, thinking about food waste and thinking about uh, my garbage and how our garbage doesn't smell. We don't even have a liner in our garbage in the kitchen. We do still have packaging that goes into that garbage, but everything else goes into the compost or um, obviously the recycling bin as well for glasses, for glass and for jar, for glass jars uh, and and uh, tin. And like my cat's cat food is all in aluminum tin cans. So all that goes in the recycling bin, but nothing goes in our garbage that would create smell. And when you reduce that, that means you're also making it, you're creating a much better atmosphere for our wild critters because people complain about about wildlife going into their garbage cans when they go out at night because of all of the food that smells. Well, there shouldn't be food in your garbage bins. Like there shouldn't be food. It's not garbage, right? Okay, I'll stop and encourage you to go listen to that podcast episode. So that's my first gift idea is loose tea. Number two, I love the idea of gifting herbs and spices. 
and jars of herbs and spices. Obviously, they'd be in glass again, so those glass jars can be used again and again and again and again. And I do live where I can go to a number of different stores and get spices uh, in bulk. So I can bring my own jars and I can have them fill it up, you know, the, the jars up with whatever spices and herbs I want. However, even if you go and get nice spices, and there's lots of spice stores these days and herb stores, uh, they would most likely come in glass. And that's what I would recommend. I would recommend not getting spices in plastic, get them in glass, can use those jars again and again, and they're wonderful gifts. And you can even package them, like make a little gift basket, uh, like calling them baking spices and get them nutmeg and cloves and cinnamon and cardamom or do Italian spices or Italian herbs and you can do parsley and basil and uh, and uh, uh, tarragon and whatever spices you want, right? Uh, you can do, um, you know, my favorite dried herbs for soup and then give them a little packet and then give them recipes as well if you want. And then add that to a basket and cover with a pretty kitchen towel, a raffia ribbon, something like that. And what a pretty gift that is. Number three, also a basket, is a fruit and nut basket. I know that sounds silly, but tell companies like Harry and David that make a gazillion dollars a year that they're that it's a silly idea. Like fruit baskets, <laughs> like that's something that people identify as a kind of quintessential holiday gift. And so what I recommend though, instead of ordering from a place like Harry and David, because they're going to have cellophane wrap and you're shipping it, is go to your local farm stand. And this is obviously if you're giving gifts to someone who's local, go to your local farm stand or farmer's market, buy some seasonal fruit, beautiful pers persimmons and pomegranates and apples, right? Some whole walnuts and get them a nice little metal nutcracker. And you can get them a jar of jam, a lot of farmer's markets, or you can find local jam, no doubt, I'm sure, uh, or preserves, or maybe you make it yourself and package that together in a, in, a, in a basket or a pretty box. And how gorgeous is that gift, right? Obviously, don't use cellophane. And then include some handwritten recipes. Maybe the fruits you're featuring, you can, you can, you can include my apple cobbler recipe from the Joy of Vegan Baking or my persimmon tea from Color Me Vegan, I, my persimmon tea cake from uh, Color Me Vegan. So you can include recipes that you love that, would go, you know, that they can use those fruits with and then share those. I think that's a great gift. Number four is... I love the ready-to-bake ingredients in a jar and a recipe. So kind of same idea is that instead of giving them, say, chocolate chip cookies, which is my fifth idea, <laughs> baked, giving them actual baked goods, give them the ingredients to make those baked goods and then give them the recipe as well. So if it's the chocolate chip cookies – you can use my chocolate chip cookie recipe from the Joy Vegan Baking, then um, obviously include the recipe, but include the exact amount of flour in one jar, the exact amount of sugar in another jar, the exact amount of baking powder, the exact amount of lemons that they're going to need, maybe even a pie plate that you pick up at a secondhand store, and then package that all together in a pretty box or basket and print out the recipe. And how personal is that? It's personalized. And then you can even say, like, let's make a date and we'll bake these together, right? So five would be baked goods. So just give them, you know, bake someone a pie. People are blown away by homemade baked goods. They just, it feels so special. It always has and it always will. So bake someone a pie or a crumble or a cobbler or make my, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name another recipe of mine because these are the recipes I know most. Caramel popcorn. Caramel popcorn and the joy of vegan baking is such a pretty quintessential holiday gift that you can put in a tin, like a popcorn tin or a cookie tin, add peanuts, and it makes a beautiful holiday gift. So baked goods is my food gift idea number five. So I'm going to stop there. I think that's I think that's enough for you to contemplate. Okay. The next category is reusables. Now, you can give these ideas individually or stocking stuffers or their secret, or good, like really good secret Santa gifts. I think things are getting better. We used to give a lot of crap, I think, to each other, just like, you know, just worthless crap for like secret Santa gifts or, you know, like novelty gifts. Like, just don't do that. Give something that's going to be meaningful and valuable uh, for a secret Santa or a stocking stuffer or a Hanukkah gift or just whatever, just a gift. You can do it individually or you can make them, make a package of them. And links for all of these are at ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com. So you can just go right to ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com, find this page, and then you can click on each one and it goes right 
right to my recommended product. So number one is reusable straws. You can get metal. I prefer stainless steel, but you could also get bamboo. There's lots of different, there's even, I mean, there's kind of the, um, what's the flexible ones? There's like lots of different ones. The reusable uh, stainless steel ones that I recommend, the package that I recommend, which is packaged in paper, uh, comes in both, and there's another one that pack- that's packaged in cloth that uh, has some straws that are straight up, some straws that have a bit of a, a bend to them. So reusable straws, stainless steel food containers are wonderful for taking on the road, for taking to lunch, for traveling with, you can use it as a lunchbox, what have you. So stainless steel food containers is a great reusable, reusable coffee cups. My husband has a Yeti. That's the one that I recommend. And But there are so many different coffee cups and, and coffee thermoses. But I'm talking like my husband, I think I mentioned this in another episode. He's been doing his like mochas in the morning. He he never used to drink coffee, but he now drinks mochas. He just enjoys it before he goes to the office. And he, you know, so many coffee stores, which is so infuriating. And I'm seeing it start to change here in California, but it's going to be a long time before this changes all around, is that by default, they give people a to-go cup. And that means also the to-go cover, with, which is plastic. And, the to- and by the way, all these coffee cups and, and tea cups that are hot, they look like they're paper, but they're plastic lined. So these are not recyclable. So the best thing to do, and even if you sit there and you say for here, like you have to request a mug because otherwise they just give you, and I just cannot stand seeing people sit in a cafe, <laughs> sit at a table in a cafe drinking their coffee or tea in, in, in throwawayable landfill cups. So David now, I mean, he used to do that, but now he brings his Yeti, he gets it filled up, and when he comes home, he washes it and then puts it in his bag, so it's in his bag for the next day. So reusable coffee cups are great, and you can also get uh, uh, thermoses. Obviously reusable grocery shopping bags. I think we have enough canvas bags in the world. Go to a Goodwill. If you don't have any canvas bags, go. you, you can find canvas bags somewhere. You don't even have to buy new ones, but that's a nice gift for, for someone. Reusable produce bags. I have a number of these in cotton. Also, you can get them in like the mesh cotton and I bring them everywhere I go. So bring them, get into the habit of keeping them in your bag, but they're wonderful gifts to give to others. Reusable water bottles, of course, same thing. That's, you know, I think most of us these days know where to find those and what our favorites are. You know I love my reusable tea thermos. I travel with it everywhere I go, and it has the strainer inside of it. My favorite is linked um, from that page on ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com. So tea, tea thermos is a wonderful gift, and you can give that, that to a friend when you give them loose tea. Reusable shampoo and conditioner bottles, and I say that because plain products, as you know, I love. you. They're stainless steel bottles, and then you return those bottles when they're empty, and they send you new ones. So that's my reusable shampoo and conditioner bottle suggestion, and that's also on my website, plain products. And then a reusable uh, travel cutlery set, same thing. I bring that with me wherever I go. You can get bamboo, you can get stainless steel, whatever. But I love that. I know a lot of people are using compostable um, cutlery, but let me tell you something, folks. If you go to a restaurant and they're giving you like corn starch based forks or potato starch based forks, if they go into a landfill where the conditions are not such that uh, they encourage composting, they will not compost. They're just going to sit and they're just going to sit for a long time. So the best thing to do is bring your own cutlery. I bring them everywhere I go. You never know when you're going to need a fork or a spoon. I don't tend to use a knife as much, but I do always make sure I have a fork and a spoon with me. So that's my other idea. So those are nine reusable ideas. So that means, what are we on? So that's 14. Okay. So the next category is experiences. And I do think, obviously, whereas we can give physical gifts and make sure they're valuable, I do think that we need to rethink when we're giving someone a gift that it doesn't have to be a physical gift. Life is about experiences, not things. You can't take it with you. And when in the end, at the end of our lives, or even now when we're reflecting on what's meaningful, it's very rarely a thing. It's usually an experience that we had with someone or even alone that I think we find is the most meaningful. So these are wonderful ways to gift family and friends uh, in a really meaningful ways, gifting them with experiences, especially um, to enhance our own lives, their lives, and to value the limited time 
we all have. So number one, just going to say the 30 day vegan challenge online course, (laughs) it is an online course. You can get it last minute. You don't need to ship it. Uh, Anything virtual, I think is going to be a wonderful gift for people. Any kind of online course, most courses you can gift for the longest time. You weren't able to gift the 30 day vegan challenge online course, but now you can. So you go to 30 day vegan challenge.com. You'll see the gift option on there. You make the purchase. And once you do, you get a coupon code. And then you write a card to your friend. You give them that coupon code. I even have sample text so that you can say to your friend, look, you know, I'm just giving this to you because even if you don't go vegan at the end of it or, you know, whatever you do at the end of the 30 days, you will learn so much about living and eating and shopping compassionately and healthfully, right? So I give you some sample text. You just have to let your friend know that whenever they're ready, they go to 30dayveganchallenge.com, they purchase it, and they put their coupon code in and it it's completely free for them. So that's a wonderful gift. You can also, of course, buy them the book, the 30 Day Vegan Challenge book as a companion, uh, wherever books are sold. But if you get the 30 Day Vegan Challenge online course as a gift, it's something you can get at the very last minute or any time of year. Number two, concert or theater tickets. I've done this before for family where this is nice too for someone who doesn't live near you, where you just figure out the theater that's near them you know, whether it's a, you know, for a play or a musical or a concert or an orchestra or an opera, whatever. So figure out what you think they would like. Go to that website, pick a show you think they would like to see and get them tickets or buy them a gift certificate and they can pick whatever concert or show they like. So that's a really lovely gift and it really shows that you've thought about them and what they like and who they are. The gift of time is my third idea, which all of these are, but Something I've done for many, many years is create a little coupon book, which you can make as simple or as elaborate as you like, and that you gift to a loved one. It could be 52 coupons, one for each day of the week. It could be 12 coupons, one for each day of the month. It could be 365 if you really have the time and are creative. The idea is to give them coupons that they can redeem for a massage, for a home-cooked meal, for a movie, for a walk, a hike, a dance. Whatever experiences you want to encourage your loved one to ask you for, they would then give you the coupon. Yeah, 365 might be a lot. Just maybe stick with 12 <laughs> or stick with 30. Uh, but they then give you the coupon and, and to redeem it, and that's what you give them. And I love that. I've been doing that since I was little. And you can, these days, there are companies that sell these kinds of things that you can customize on their website. But I just like making my own. Up to you giving the gift of time in a coupon book. Number four is travel by theme. So this is something you can create with someone you travel with or that you're close with, uh, you know, obviously a partner, but even a good friend or family member. M- I've told you this before that David and I have set ourselves the goal to sleep in every county in California. We love our state so much and there's so much to see. It's a big state. There are 58 counties. So we make a point to do so by having created this goal. And we experience areas we never would have otherwise experienced. And we meet people that we otherwise would never have met if we weren't trying to reach this goal. So it's fun to create themes Uh, And you can even create themes for just, you know, it doesn't have to be travel. It could be, you know, hiking new trails in your area or taking different walks or going down different streets or learning different neighborhoods. Like make themes that you do together. And that's something you can do throughout the year. A long time ago when we lived on the East Coast, we used to do the lighthouses of New England. That was one of the themes we did. We didn't finish them, but we did do and saw a lot of lighthouses in New England. Uh, Seeing all of the national parks in North America is on our list. And that can be done either by driving or by train. doesn't have to include flying, but if you want to fly, you could also make vegan trips, your CPG vegan trips, one of your gifts. Um, But I know that air travel, obviously we all face the fact that air travel uh, uses a lot of carbon emissions. And of course, that's difficult to to reconcile. I was talking to one of our travel travelers recently, uh, Barry and Allison. Hi, Barry. Hi, Allison. I know you're listening. Barry and Allison came to Rwanda with us uh, last year or 2019, and they're coming to Botswana with us in 2020. And we were talking about how whether or not those carbon offsets are meaningful, you know, the carbon offsets that you can make once you make a plane trip reservation, you can give money to an organization that plants trees, or they take some other action that offsets the carbon that you use in the flight that you take. And we were talking about how we're not sure about the companies. I don't know. Like, I'm sure there are legit companies, but I just don't feel comfortable enough to say, here's 150 bucks to go offset my flight or whatever you pay. 
30 bucks, whatever it is. And I was thinking instead of paying a company to do this and making in like not knowing if it's going to get done, what about just planting trees myself for every flight I take? Now, we don't have any more room to plant trees because we've planted a lot of trees. I can cheat and say, well, that was for that flight. That was for that flight, but that, that would be lying. So maybe I can plant a tree for a neighbor or a school, or I can get involved locally to plant trees in urban areas or in areas that have been devastated by a fire or a hurricane. So that, I think, works for me, and I'm going to look into this. I really like this idea. I'd like to know what you think. And of course, yes, not flying at all is the best thing to offset our carbon, but I'm just thinking out loud carbon offsets by planting our own trees. Just a thought. Number five experience idea is local walking tours. I love walking tours. Everywhere we go, I don't care if it sounds cheesy to you, whatever city we go to, when we can do a walking tour of that town or city, we do. They're usually led by docents who love where they live and they relish sharing the history of the place with others. There are so many cities that have walking tours. Some of them have a lot, like they have themed walking tours. It might be a literary walking tour, a history or women's history or black history or architectural history or just architecture. So go to your city or if you're traveling some, go to your city's website and just sign you and a friend up or give a gift certificate or buy a gift certificate or, you know, say that you're going to buy, whatever. What a fabulous gift to give to someone, especially in places where we live and that we don't take advantage of. Don't take for granted where you live. We need to love where we live and get to know where we live and be engaged and be part of where we live. Um, so what a, what, a, what a fabulous gift idea to give someone a local walking tour. Or if you, if you don't live near someone that you want, like find out the, if there's walking tours in the city of the person you want to give a gift to and give them the gift certificate. Um, so go check, I mean, Chamber of Commerce websites or the city. Usually it's like the municipality, like the city's website. They would have it. But just type in walking tours. If your friend lives in Detroit, Detroit walking tours. And then find out how you can get a, a gift certificate for a walking tour for your friend to take whenever they're ready to take it. Um, many are free. Some ask for donations. Those that charge, it's minimal. It's worth it, I promise. So that is number five in my ideas for experiences. Uh, Bonus idea, just to remind you that another digital idea is my Joyful Vegan Worldwide Conference, like I said, was moved to February. So that is something you can gift someone. Um, I really think that, I mean, it's going to cover a lot around being engaged in a world that is meat, dairy, and egg focused. And so I think it's a gift you can give to a nonprofit organization whose staff or volunteers would benefit from this conference. You can give it to a fellow activist. You can buy a seat for a friend. But I do think this is a meaningful way to engage people in this larger conversation about living vegan in a non-vegan world. So uh, register for yourself or for a friend at joyfulvegan.com. Now, my next category is books. Obviously, as a reader and a writer, I'm a huge fan of books, even if they're ebooks or audiobooks. I usually buy a bunch of favorite books that I give throughout the year. It's true, I do give physical books, but my God, I mean, I'm one of these people who values books so much, and you can tell by how much I've written in them and circled, and they're wrinkled, and they're red, and the binding's broken. When people come to me with my books like that, like when they have my books, they want me to sign. It's my favorite thing in the world because it means you're loving that book, you're valuing that book, and that's what I want to see. So uh, so giving physical books, I, I think that is something we can absolutely value. However, like I said, if there's things in our life that we are not valuing, then we want to get we want to give them away to someone who is going to value them. So we've culled a lot of our physical books and donated them to the library, which you know I really encourage people to do. And we are buying a lot of uh, ebooks. I read a lot of ebooks uh, now just because I like not bringing more physical things into my world unless they're very special books, uh, and also just makes it easy to read and travel and read at night and not have to have to have a light, etc. So. But you can gift, you know, Kindle books or ebooks. You can gift audiobooks to people now and obviously physical books. So I tend to buy my favorite books in like, a, I get a bunch. And so I just have them. So for instance, what was an example, right? Like, um, 
you know, just like people who come into my house or my life and I we start talking and there's, you know, some depth to our conversation and I just want to give them a book that I think is meaningful. I just like having a book that I can just give to them. Um, I give away my favorite books that I use as manuals for everyday living that I think are just the most incredible books ever written. And so you can find your own books, create your own books that you find a lot of meaning in. My books, you've heard me talk about the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. Uh, obviously, this is a 2,000-year-old book. There are thousands of translations of this book. My favorite translation is Stephen Mitchell. So if you're interested in a book that I think is the best manual for living ever written, The Tao Te Ching, it's short and uh, it's incredible. And I read it every day and I'm also memorizing it. Incredible. So that's my, that's one of my meaningful books. Uh, so the Tao Te Ching Meditations uh, by Marcus Aurelius is another that is so similar in many ways to the Tao Te Ching that uh, this is also a manual for living that I absolutely relish. And I'm I'm I'll t- I'll talk more about what I do in a second related to that book. I'm memorizing some of the passages, but there's, it's a lot harder to memorize meditations. It's a lot longer, um, and there are a lot of translations of meditations by Marcus Aurelius. I I uh, recommend the one by Gregory Hayes. The third book that I recommend is The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday. Uh, I'm very attracted to, if it's not obvious, to Stoicism. That's Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus. And Ryan Holiday is a young Stoic, uh, and he's really made it his life's work goal to to use the Stoics, the ancient Stoics, as a uh, you know basically as a lessons and gifts, and and we have there's so much wisdom in the Stoics, in Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus, and uh, these are the ones whose uh, writings we still have. That uh, he created a book called the the Daily Stoic, and it's 365 days of or just a past from one of those Stoics and then kind of his interpretation of it. And I am not someone who likes, I just find some of them can be really cheesy, like those daily meditations. And I I just don't go for those a lot. But this one, I absolutely love. And I will tell you also, just as an aside, his website, dailystoic.com. I think it's dailystoic.com. Might be net, but I think it's dailystoic.com. Also has a a daily email list you can sign up for. Love, love it so much. So I love Ryan Holiday. He has other books as well, but it's the Daily Stoic that I think is a great gift and I use it every day. It's part of my my, my morning routine. Uh, Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker is a book that I have gifted people. And I just think if you want to feel in any way hopeful and have any perspective of our world and where we are today relative to where we have been in the past and also relative to our fears about where we are based on where we think we're going. I cannot recommend this book more highly. It is it is it it basically uses all the ways we can measure progress whether we're talking about poverty or women's rights or happiness or um, health. I mean, in every way we can measure progress, Stephen has looked at all the data and in every way says, we are better today than we have ever been. And there's evidence that we're continuing to be, to get better. However, even though we have a long way to go, knowing based on data, what we've done well, we have to keep implementing those things so we can keep doing them better, right? Like in terms of like democracy and democratic principles, like like we have we we need to keep fighting for them and keep furthering those, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 progressive ideals. Um, but we can at least celebrate what has been done well. And so it is one of these books that it's it's a tome, but it is, I think, a book that if anybody, if you know anybody who feels pessimistic about the state of the world, read Enlightenment Now. I think you will find, and I hope your recipient will find, that it is life-changing. Zuberbia is a book that I've talked about before. It's by Tal Moses. It's about, um, it's about, it's just kind of, it's a, her own journal about wildlife in her urban setting at the time. She lived in Oakland, and it's a book that I've given to a lot of friends. I really love it. I think she's an incredible writer, and I love it. And then the other thing I think is a really great gift is giving blank journals um, and and also giving what is called a commonplace book. So I mentioned that I was going to explain what I do with meditations aside from memorizing some passages. So I journal every day. 
But I also keep a common book, and this was inspired by the Stoics, a commonplace book. Ryan Holiday explains it, and I have a link on my website to where Ryan Holiday explains the commonplace book. You just type that in, and you can find blog posts about it. it. It came from the Stoics. The idea is not only to record your own thoughts that I do through journaling and free writing, but also to record quotes and thoughts of others you find meaningful and that you want to remember and just look back on so that you can keep you can keep a commonplace book as index cards and a filing system but i like keeping it as a journal and getting a numbered uh, journal uh, an aligned journal and then i have copied all of my passages from the Tao Te Ching that i love even though like i could just copy the whole book and then same thing with meditations i'm right now every morning part of my morning routine is to go and write into my commonplace book quotes from all the other books that I find meaningful. So buying blank journals for folks, and you can implement the commonplace book idea yourself, or telling a friend that, I think is a, I think is a lovely, meaningful gift. And then, of course, as an author, I'm proud of my seven babies. If you'd like to buy one of my books as gifts for others, of course, you will have made it worth all the work that I have put into each of them. So The Joy of Vegan Baking, The Vegan Table, Color Me Vegan, Vegan's Daily Companion, The Daily Vegan Journal, The 30-Day Vegan Challenge, and The Joyful Vegan are my books, and thank you for that. So those are some gifts. Now for the lessons. Now I'm not here to teach you any lessons. I'm not here to teach you anything you don't know. I would never presume to do that. But I can share with you what I do to create a meaningful life. Take them or leave them. But this is what I do and have always done and hopefully will continue to do to live a meaningful life. And the first thing to say is that the foundation of all of this is that that is my intention, is to live each day in a meaningful way. I don't always succeed, but that is my intention, is to live a meaningful life. I think we all want that. Now, for me, being vegan, which is the physical manifestation of my deepest values, is the most significant way I do this. But it's so integrated into my life that I don't think about it consciously because it is just a manifestation of my values. I don't think about it consciously other than being grateful that I can choose to make conscious and compassionate choices every day, every day. By, ve- by being vegan. Now, other ways I create meaning in my life are as follows. I've made a list of 20. <laughs> now, there might be 25, there might be 18, I don't know. But I've decided to fit them in, because I like lists, into a neat list of 20. So here are 20 things I do every day to live a meaningful life. Number one, I wake up very early. I wake up around 5.30 every morning. Morning is my favorite time of the day, and I love getting up early to make the most of the day. I go to bed around 10 or 11, and I wake up around 5, 5.30. If I wake up at 6, I feel like it's already late. Number two, I ha- and you might not want to wake up early, but making the most of our day and making the most of our time and doing that in a way that you, that you can, that's meaningful for you and that's possible for you, do it. Number two, I have a morning ritual of contemplation, and I love my morning ritual. If I don't do my morning ritual, it throws my whole day off. That means for me, having tea, journaling, going outside when I can, when the weather is conducive to it. I mean, I have an area where it's covered, but it might be too cold sometimes. And I've gone out there like losing like the feeling in my fingers because I just want to be outside. (laughs) So sometimes it's too cold. But I get my tea, I go outside, I journal. I read, I reflect, and I meditate. Um, I don't meditate every day, but that's one, like it's just, it's my, my ritual of contemplation. It's about writing and thinking about the day to come, but also about, I do my commonplace book, I write down other people's quotes, I read. Having a morning ritual of contemplation is very meaningful for me. It really shapes my whole day. If I don't do it, it throws my whole day off. Um, number three, I really do very naturally feel very optimistic, but I but a lot of it is because I focus on hope rather than dwell on what's bad. I keep perspective and I know that there is bad in this world, but I know that's not all there is. And I focus on the good and I focus on what I can do and I focus on the hope and I focus on what we've done well so we can do more of it. So that's number three about how I live a meaningful life. Number four, I spend time in nature every day. As I said, I'm outside a lot and I realize I'm in California, so I can do that a lot throughout the year. But every day I hike or I walk or I otherwise immerse myself in nature in some way. And again, my day is also thrown off if I don't. Number five, I exercise. Some of that comes from the time I spend in nature, but whereas I don't run much anymore because I tore my meniscus and then I had meniscus surgery, meniscus repair surgery, um, 
I, I actually am planning on doing some more running next year, but I do ride, um, I have a stationary bike that I ride in the morning and I do weights, but then in the afternoon I do some kind of like long hour and a half hike or walk. I'd be miserable if I, if I just sat still, I'd be miserable. Number six, I express gratitude every day. I've been keeping gratitude lists for years. And again, I'll be honest, it comes very naturally for me. I've always been someone who is very grateful for what I have. And there are, there are a lot of things that don't come naturally to me. So I don't want to make it sound like I do all these things and they all just come so naturally. There are plenty of things that don't come. I don't like patience does not come naturally to me. (laughs) Um, I, So there are plenty of things that don't come naturally, but being grateful is something that comes very natural to me, but it is something you can cultivate by practicing it. And I actually found some old journals recently, like from 25 or 30 years ago, and I was keeping gratitude lists back then. And there's lots of research that indicates that keeping gratitude lists makes you healthier and happier. So being grateful, keeping lists, or just at least saying them in your mind every day when you wake up, every night when you go to bed, keeping a grateful, um, a gratitude list. Number seven, I prioritize my most significant relationships, namely my marriage, but also my friendships and relationships with my friends, my neighbors, my community. And I try to tell them, and if you're listening and you are a friend, I hope that you feel appreciated and loved because I try to tell my friends how much I do appreciate them and when, I, when I'm when i sad, when I don't feel like we're connected um, because I really, really value my friendships and my relationships. I certainly tell my husband every day how much I appreciate him. Number eight, I read. Um, both fiction and nonfiction, history and philosophy, poetry and politics, I think reading is the best way to understand the world, the people in it, what makes us tick, why we make the decisions we do. And of course, reading people who have been, you know, who have had wisdom that has been passed down all over all these centuries, Um, reading, you know, perspectives that are different from mine, reading people who are smarter than me, and that's most people. So reading, I think, is a way to add a lot of meaning to our lives. Number nine, I'm engaged as a citizen. I vote, I reach out to elected officials, I even started a political action committee with other concerned citizens, uh, the East Bay Animal Pack. I cannot separate my human beingness with my citizenness. So for me, it's a no-brainer and a great gift to be involved in democracy and politics, and that does bring meaning to my life. Ten, I try to be thoughtful in speech and thought, mindful in speech and thought, even though I am not perfect, and I've said and thought things I wish I hadn't, of course, but I do aspire to be mindful, to not gossip about people, to not character assassinate, to not even participate when other people are gossiping, to try and change the subject or say good things about the person that they're saying bad things about. I try not to put people down. I try not to spread rumors or talk about people in petty ways. I am not perfect. I have certainly done all of those things, but I aspire to be mindful in my speech and thought. Related to that, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt and remember that everyone has a perspective even if it's different from mine, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's different. But I, but in speech, it really it is interesting how we fill up space with words, often meaningless words. I will speak for myself. I know I do that. And there are plenty of times when I'm annoyed or angry or, you know, feeling egotistical and I want my point of view to be heard. It's so interesting to stop and think and... I I use WhatsApp and I used to use Voxer and I use the voice memos a lot and friends of mine, we do the same thing, my husband, a lot of friends. And I just prefer the voice to typing on my phone. I hate texting on my phone, just hurts my fingers. And so Voxer, that's an app that allows you to do voice memos. It's basically like a walkie-talkie app. One thing about Voxer is that, or at least in the in the free version, I don't know if the paid version is different, is you can't undo what you've just said. <laughs> so there have been times, I mean, nothing like attacking someone because they're my friends who I'm talking to, but talking about somebody else or just expressing angst or anger or annoyance in a way that maybe was just less gracious than it could have been. But with Voxer, you couldn't undo it. You couldn't. So you'd be talking and holding the button And you'd be like, I just said that, and I wish I could take that back, but I can't. There's no way. And so when I stop pressing this button, you're going to hear this, whoever I'm talking to. WhatsApp, I'm really grateful 
Because, well, you'd think that Voxer would have made me more mindful of not saying things, but it didn't, it didn't, it didn't. I just wanted to undo what I said. Whereas WhatsApp, you can leave a whole voice memo and before you hit send, you can consider not sending it and you can just cancel it. And you can delete it once you send it. But if your friend, if someone's already heard it, you can't undo that. But obviously you can first take a look at it and listen to it before you send it, or you can delete it right away. And I have done that many, many, many times. Uh, and it is a good, it's really good. I mean, because I'll be leaving this voice memo and then and then finish it. And I go, I don't want to send that. Like, that's ridiculous. I could say that much better. I could say it with much more integrity. And so luckily I have the opportunity to do that. There is a quote in Marcus Aurelius's Meditations that goes, this is one of the ones I have memorized because it's something I now say every morning and throughout the day, and especially if there's something that annoys me or a post on social media or a comment that someone has, the, this is one of the things of the many, many, many wise words that Marcus Aurelius wrote. It goes, how to act, never under compulsion, out of selfishness, without forethought, and with misgivings. Never under compulsion, out of selfishness, without forethought, or with misgivings. And so I can't tell you how many times I am going, I'm, I regret that. That's the misgivings part. Or have I really thought about that? Do I really want to do that? Do I really want to rethink that? And I love that quote. So just keeping that in mind uh, has prevented my saying a lot of stupid things I might otherwise regret and have had to make amends for. Number 11, I make amends <laughs> to those I've hurt. And I forgive people who I felt hurt by. I say I'm sorry when I've done something wrong, uh, when I've done something to hurt someone, whether I've done it intentionally or not. I take responsibility for my actions in the world. And that means also that I have to be mindful that when someone does something to hurt me, even my feeling hurt is my responsibility because oh, there's another wonderful quote and gosh, and this one's in Seneca. Okay, I'm doing this by from memory. So it goes, is this Seneca? No, this might be Marcus Aurelius. No, this is Marcus Aurelius. It goes, don't be hurt and you won't feel hurt. Don't feel hurt and you haven't been so the idea is that it's my responsibility that if someone does something, it's not to me. They're just doing it. And whether or not I choose to get hurt by it is mine. We can have a whole conversation about that. You might not agree because, of course, it's a lot easier to say, no, 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 people do bad things. And they're, in the end, it's how we take them and how we respond to them uh, that's ours. And that's the whole premise of Stoicism is that nothing that happens in this world uh, it happens, you know, the only things that we can control are the things that we can control. And that's usually just ourselves, our thoughts, our actions, our perceptions. And so, yeah, that's a whole other conversation. But that's number 11 is that I make amends to those I've hurt and I forgive those I have felt hurt by. Number 12, I live my life, this is going to sound morbid, but I live my life as if I've got a death sentence. And I do. We all do. Uh, that means I try to put things in order every day so that if something happened to me tomorrow, the people who needed to know that I loved them or heard me tell them, hopefully knew it in the last time I spoke to them. And the people who needed me to make amends will have gotten it, I hope. I'm sure there's people I've hurt who, I, who either have not forgiven me or they have not heard my amends. But that's my hope. Um, you know, and then there's the practical aspects. I have arrangements made, you know, for my cats, for instance, if something should happen to David and I at the same time. Um, of course, we've created our wills and trusts um, to account for our future demise so that we know where, you know, you know our assets are going to go and how I want to donate our money. We don't have children, so we, you know, need to be mindful of where this is going to go, um, you know, but also just, like I said, taking care of our cats. But just keeping like just getting things in order and trying to live every day like it's my last and that doesn't mean I go out and party and I'm irresponsible every day it means that I am mindful about living the most meaningful life um, I can because I might not have the opportunity to tomorrow 13 as I said I create goals and intentions every day short term long term lofty reasonable unreasonable but I do create intentions for the day and that really guides me throughout the day 14, I do things that bring me joy. 
Sometimes that means baking cookies. Sometimes that means watching the Great British Bake Off. Sometimes that means watching the deer out my window. And sometimes it means visiting the gorillas in Rwanda. Sometimes it means reading alone. Sometimes it means being with friends. I do things that bring me joy and I'm grateful I have the agency and the leisure time to be able to do that. I'm very grateful for that. 15, I try to bring joy to others. I love making people laugh. I like doing small things that make someone else make someone else smile. I just like making people happy. And I have, again, done my fair share of making people unhappy and being, you know, thoughtless and hurtful. And if I've ever done that to any of you listening, I apologize. But I try to bring joy to people in my life and to the people I don't know. Um, One thing I do, I I pay attention when friends say something that they like, if they say that they love this kind of wine or they like this brand of chocolate or they like this artist. I keep a list on on Google Docs and so it's accessible on my phone. So if I'm shopping or if I'm getting something or it's their birthday or it's the holidays and I want to give them a gift, I can just look on that list and say, oh my gosh, my friend said she loved... I don't know, Ardbeg scotch, and I can go get a bottle of scotch for them. Or this person said they love this artist, and I can maybe go get a print of that artist and get it framed for them. Or I don't know, if it's a song they liked, I can, you know, just send them the lyrics. I mean, just little things just so I can keep track of what my friends say they like so that I can bring them joy and make them happy. 16, I volunteer with organizations that need my help. Currently, I'm a kitty cuddler with Maine Coon Adoptions here in Oakland, and I get to see the direct impact of my kitty cuddling, of my socializing the cats. It has been incredibly gratifying. I've been doing it for a year now. And then related to that, I became a foster mom of two adorable cats who are sitting here in this room with me right now. I'm looking at both of them. They are adorable, uh, Basil and Bo, who were born in Beirut, Lebanon, and they... Um, they, their mom was killed by a car and an incredible woman rescued the two of them and they made their way to the States. They've been with Maine Coon Adoptions for a year now, if not more, actually, might be more. They've been with us for several months. And by the time you hear this, they may well have been adopted and gone to their forever home. I'm going to cry um, because um, there, um, there was an application that came in early this week to adopt them, like specifically looking for these two, wanted these two cats, and I've now been in touch with them. Anyway, they've their whole adoption process has been approved. They are officially approved. The only thing is now Sunday they come to meet them. And, uh, and oh, barring something crazy like they're, I don't know, monsters or something, which they won't be, um, Basil and Bo should be going to their forever home on Sunday. And... I never thought I would foster cats. I thought, or meaning I never thought I would be able to foster because I never thought I'd be able to do this emotionally because these are two cats I actually very much love. Not that I wouldn't love any cat I take care of or any of the cats I I cuddle, but Basil, the black and white, and Bo, both of them. But Basil, he was my first cuddle (laughs) at Maine Coon. And I have pictures of him because um, Christy and I cuddle together. And I have a picture of me because Basil walked out of the cage and into my arms and he immediately just, he just got my heart. And uh, and I know it sounds crazy that we didn't adopt them, but we have two kitties of our own, Charlie and Michiko, and I'm not ready to be a four cat person, four cat house, four cat person, four cat house. Um, I just want Charlie and Michiko to still have all of me. And I just, a lot, four is a lot. And the whole reason I fostered them was to give them the opportunity to thrive in a home and then make it possible for them to have a photo shoot so that they could get a, you know, so they could be here and and then someone could see their pictures and adopt them. And it's happened. So um, I'm really excited and I've told their prospective parents that Basil and Bo have their own Instagram account. And if you want to keep following it, it sounds like she said she's really excited about that because she was going to start an Instagram account for her new kitties. And she's hoping they'll be Basil and Bo. And again, Sunday they should be taking them home. And uh, and she said that she would love to keep that account so people can keep following them. So if you want to file, follow Basel and Bo, it's Basel like Switzerland, B-A-S-E-L and B-E-A-U. So B-A-S-E-L and B-E-A-U. It's Basel and Bo. And it has been really gratifying doing this. So trying to help where I can and volunteer. I don't know if I'm going to foster again. I could see myself doing it, but today is not the day to ask. It's going to be a very emotional weekend. Uh, but, uh, but 
but I'm going to continue volunteering and continue kitty cuddling. And it's very gratifying. So where I can volunteer, I do. 17, I donate uh, to organizations that need me, uh, to people who need me, to influencers. It doesn't have to just be a nonprofit. I support the causes that I care about. Uh, I've actually changed the way I financially support organizations. People ask me all the time who I support. Uh, let's see, it changes all the time, but I am now deciding to do fewer small donations. Well, actually, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it the way I used to, which is giving small donations to a lot of organizations. I'm giving larger donations to a fewer organizations, and I just feel like that has um, an impact that that I that I like. And so, but I will say this as an influencer that you support every little bit does count and I and I still support organizations in small amounts but I do tend to give bigger amounts now um, like annually as opposed to just small amounts and uh, the organizations right now I support are Project Coyote uh, I support uh, Cat Town uh, I support Wild Care and I am missing some organizations but those are the big ones that I've been sending um, larger donations to so yes, so 17 is I donate and support the causes I care about and the organizations I care about. 18 is I am aware of and present with and involved in the lives of non-human critters in this world. I am a resident among residents. I am only one resident among all of the non-human residents in this world, in my backyard, in my neighborhood, on my street. And this means I take the time to find a, you know, to, find, to help a stray animal if I see a stray animal, to look at the tag of an animal who doesn't look like they should be uh, in the street, and to find their people. I plant native plants to attract and support native insects and birds and mammals. I put water out for wildlife. I call animal control if I see an injured animal or a dead animal on the street. I bury dead animals I, I've come across on the side of the road, and I contact the native the person if I can to tell them that their animal has died I just try to be a citizen of the world and be mindful of that I am not the only one in it and that if we just looked around we just could be a lot more helpful than we think we can and that's pretty gratifying 19 is I try to face my fears it is the hardest thing to do to face our fears and stretch our comfort zones but I aspire to do that and when I do it it is very meaningful uh, so I try to stretch and not live and view the world myopically. I try to see things from other people's perspective. I try to not judge someone else's perspective. I try to do things differently than I've done them before. I just try and stretch and face my fears and, and yeah, and just try to live as largely as possible as opposed to living small. And number 20, I just keep in mind that I'm a practicing human. I think I'm a lot easier on other people than I am on myself, but I try to remember that I'm a practicing human, as is everyone else in the world. We're all doing the best we can in this crazy world. That will continue to turn once we're gone. I am just a small blip in the vastness of this universe, and while I will be forgotten one day... The least I can do is to try to live meaningfully and compassionately while I'm here. Why? Because it's just the right thing to do and because it feels so much better than the opposite. Lessons and gifts, that's all we get. And may we relish them all, even if they're difficult lessons and hard-won gifts, because it means we're among the living. For the animals, this is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Thank you for listening.